Okay, so good afternoon and welcome to this uh, bird of a feather session on farming together. Um, it's actually uh, a bird of a feather session, uh, but it doesn't appear to be on the agenda as that, so apologies if you've come expecting not to participate. Um, if you're not familiar with the, this format, uh, a BOF or a bird of a feather session is one where the presentation is slightly lightweight, it's less formal, uh, with a view for us to discuss and collaborate and, and find out how we can work together. Sure. Okay. Uh, so feel free to pitch in at any point and raise your hand or say what you need to say. Uh, I'm going to divide this into two parts. The first part will be me talking about my view on the ecosystem for uh, farms, and the second part's us collaborating and discussing what we need to do to improve. Uh, before we begin, perhaps we can have a show of hands. Uh, raise your hand if you're, you currently have a farm, you're considering making one, or you're maintaining one. Okay, uh, nearly a full house. Uh, I guess that's why we're here. So, I'll share with you my idea on what I think a farm is. Um, in my view, a farm is some hardware, a system that allows you to interact and automate interaction with embedded devices, such as reference boards, um, and the purpose to that is so that you can, in an automated way, turn on a board, put some software on it, and run some tests. Um, and the benefit of this, of course, is that in your continuous integration flow, you get to have, add two new boxes. So after you've used something like Jenkins to build some artifacts, you can automatically deploy them and put them on your board, and then you can automatically test them and then feed the the results back into whatever comes next, usually perhaps some email notification or, or similar. The picture in the background is also uh, what I consider to be my ideal farm. Something that looks beautiful, lots of rack mounts, organized, beautiful cables, uh, structured, all these lovely words. But I think if you've already got a farm, you'll know that it's really hard to do that and that's not quite the reality. So. This is the reality, quite often. Um, this isn't my farm. Th these are some farms I, I found online. They might be yours. Uh, does anyone want to own up? Anyone recognize this? Are they the same? Oh, OK, sure. I think, yeah, three electrons. Um, not sure about the other one. Um, and it's because it's difficult. It, it's really difficult to manage a bunch of hardware and cable them all up to the same place and add power supplies. Um, and they're very diverse. Every person's farm will look quite different. Uh, some use shelves, some use drawers, um, some you just use the floor. Um, and in fact, a, a quote I found by someone describing their farm was, uh, it's a pile of stuff, which, yeah, is accurate. Um, so, a picture of our farm. Um, ours is still a sprawling mess, but we, we did try to um, put uh, it in a rack mount. We had some good intentions. Uh, originally, our farm was uh, designed when we had no office so that our home workers, our, our employees, could access customer hardware and share hardware. And this saved shipping hardware back and forth. It meant we could protect our customers' hardware. Um, and do all the right things. As you can see, we have a rack mount, we have shelves, and hardware is on the shelves, um, and all those um, reference boards are connected via USB and Ethernet to one machine, which we call the farm machine, which is just a desktop PC running a Linux distribution. Um, if you want to use the farm, you SSH into it, and then using some of our proprietary scripts, which we call EB farm scripts, you can do things like turn on a board, look at the serial console, um, whatever else it does. Our board farm is part of the Kernel CI project, which we can talk about in a short while. Uh, this is a project where um, when the community develops new kernel releases, uh, they're automatically built and deployed on farms across the world, and, and some of our boards are part of that. So on a daily basis, um, our boards are being used to test the kernel's boot. Um, we also use it to run automated tests for some of our customers. Uh, the capabilities of our farm, um, we can control the power to boards, we can turn them on and off, 
uh, using USB uh, relays, we can uh, press buttons or flick uh, switches. Uh, we designed our own SD MUX hardware. Uh, this is something that allows you to um, <laughs> give it some giggles. Um, that allows you to uh, change the contents of an SD card so that you can, if, if you've got a, uh, some hardware that boots from SD card, you can completely control what boots. Um, at one point, we had a HDMI receiver card so that uh, if a board has HDMI outputs, uh, it was possible to Skype into our, our board farm and see what's going on, which was quite useful for the project we had at the time. Uh, we've also got some concepts like workspaces, so if you want to use a board, you can create a workspace and have TFTP NFS in a convenient way. Um, and we do all this through containers as well, so that uh, when you SSH into the farm, you have your own workspace so that you're not going to uh, break someone else's environment. Uh, slightly closer look. Uh, this is a, a farm shelf. Um, what we try to do is put each unit of hardware on a board, uh, like a plastic uh, sheet, and we secure the hardware to that board with things like Velcro or uh, tape or pillars. Um, and we put everything we need for that board. Uh, you can see that we try to uh, have some common interfaces. So we have for each board uh, power, Ethernet and USB, um, and we try and make that uniform across the farm. At one point, we thought about having a USB stick that's on each shelf, which describes the topology of the USB devices in it. Uh, the idea being that if you have a shelf, you can plug it into the farm, and the farm automatically knows what it is, how to access the devices on it, so you don't need to do any kind of configuration. Um, and of course, the idea being that you can remove a shelf, work it with it on your desk, put it back in your farm, perhaps someone else's. Um, in this particular case, uh, this customer, we help them with surveillance software, and uh, their update mechanism uses SD cards. So in order to test that, we use our farm, and we, um, we test that we can upgrade to different versions of the software. And we can do that hundreds of times a night, which saves a lot of manual intervention that would otherwise be needed to do that. Um, we also run CPU load tests over about an hour so that we can get a, a good profile of, of the latest software um, to see if there's any regressions in performance and some other metrics. And at the end of this, uh, we get some automated emails and test results um, that we find uh, our customer finds extremely useful. Uh, this hasn't been easy. Um, if you've played with farms, you'll be familiar with some of these issues. I'm sure you have many others. Um, USB is, it seems like farms are quite a good test for USB. Um, I don't know if I just buy really crap hardware, but quite often hubs disappear, USB to serials disappear. And of course, they come back with slightly different um, major minor numbers, which, which confuse lots of things, especially if you're running a long test. Um, Reliability is, is the biggest challenge. Uh, it's, it's easy to make a test, it's easy to do this stuff, but then to keep doing that consistently and reliably um, is difficult, especially as you try and scale the farm, uh, which is a challenge. SD Max, it works for our needs, but it's not reliable and it's been very challenging to, to get that to be useful. Um, for our containers, we used OpenVZ, I think in hindsight that was a bad choice, um, and that's created lots of obstacles uh, for us. Uh, simply maintaining the farm, keeping it from sprawling, keeping it tidy, uh, stopping people from poaching hardware from it and cables when they need it, <laughs> is all quite difficult. And, and we're managing this through our own time rather than some ID, IT department. And of course, if something breaks, like Kernel CI, you need someone to spend time to investigate. and. And that type of support infrastructure is a challenge, um, especially if sometimes you don't know that um, a board is, is broken in some way in your farm. Um, we do a lot of testing with uh, Tickle and Expect. Uh, so some of our tests, they um, boot a board, wait for a prompt, and then uh, execute some commands on there. Uh, but I don't know if this is testing in general or, or Tickle, um, but I find that you write a test, you run it, it doesn't pass. 
and you run the same steps by hand manually, and it does pass. And, and there's this really difficult intermittent <coughs> type of issue, and it's really hard to make tests that keep passing. And, and you find quite often it's because of infrastructure issues. Um, but I think if anything, if I've learned anything, farm seemed to be the latest trend. I think a few years ago it used to be boot time, but now people seem to have moved on from that and looking at things like farms. Um, and I think there's a reason for that, and I think it's because farms, whilst they can be quite cool in themselves, they're, they're quite enabling. They allow you to, to or do automated testing, and that's what truly provides value for open source development, but also commercial development, uh, because they provide a mechanism to maintain a level of quality and to spot regressions. Um, it's also having quite a big impact on the open source community. Uh, I think the, the most notable one is Kernel CI. Um, I briefly mentioned this earlier, but uh, Kernel CI is a project where um, every time a, a number of trees are monitored in, in the, the kernel community, and when changes are made to those kernel trees, um, servers around the world build uh, those kernels for lots of different configurations and using farms like ours, and I think there's another perhaps 12, um, those kernels are deployed and booted, and, and if boards don't boot, that feedback gets sent back to the community and regressions can be fixed. And even something simple like a boot test is incredibly valuable for the kernel community because when you support so many different boards and so many different configs, it's really hard just to make sure they all still boot. Um, so that's having an impact. Um, there's the OS ADL, I believe they have a lab, and they use that for um, ensuring that the real-time patch set um, doesn't regress. I think they probably run a uh, cyclic test to check for real-time latency. Qualcomm, I uh, learned, have a board farm to test their open WRT distribution. Um, don't know much more about that. Um, Intel have a zero-day test spot. I think it's predominantly x86. Uh, but nonetheless, it's another example of where we're using automated testing to improve quality. Um, and of course, there must be uh, huge deployments in private companies um, to test products and similar. Um, but in my view, I think we're, we're touching the surface. I think we're all individually making farms, but we're still at the basics. We're still at the, can you boot a board? Can you just test um, connectivity. Um, we're not going beyond that. I think we could do more with, with boot time, with power management. Uh, we could even add interfaces to you know, test that outputs from the board like audio are as expected. Um, I think there's so much more we can do. But the problem I see is that there's perhaps too much diversity. It, it reminds me of, um, I, I guess, in the history of computing when when computers first came about, every manufacturer would have their own architecture. And there's lots of interest in developments, but in silos. So everyone's working on the same problems, coming up with different solutions, and there's no interoperability between them. Um, and that's the same with farming. There's no blueprint for how you make a farm. If, if I asked you, how do I make a farm, I would get different answers from everyone. There's no generally accepted way of doing this. There's no resource um, available that's like a wiki, for example. Um, and there's very little collaboration in terms of software that can run. Tim? We should discuss all this on the farming mailing list. There's oh, a farm mailing list? list. <laughs> no, <there isn't. laughs> exactly. Um, so it's not a surprise that everyone comes up with their own solution. And I think in a presentation I was at last year, someone talked about using Lego to create a farm. Is, is that person in the room? Yes. OK, so people. Yeah. Well, I'm most interested in that container for board for support for board. So it's your rack. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, I guess it works well. Um, but I think generally we're all facing the same challenges where we're trying to make something scalable, something reliable, something useful that we can use as a, a platform for testing or maybe remote access to boards. Um, I, I see it this way. I see there being three different aspects to farms. 
Uh, the bit that gets the most attention is at the top, which is the kind of continuous integration type of DevOps type of stuff. Uh, Jenkins, most people are familiar with. Um, I mentioned kern kernel CI, which sits on top of Lava, which is provided by Linaro. Um, and what other proprietary test frames you might have. I think that part of the system is, is quite mature. I think there's lots of support, lots of documentation. Um, the bottom part is hardware. Um, this is the physical hardware. If you've got PDUs or some kind of network controlled power supply, USB relays. Um, we talked about SD muxes. Um, I think there's a lack of information in this area where collaboration would be useful. Uh, simply knowledge on what USB devices are good quality, which ones aren't. Um, with the SD MUX, um, it turns out lots of people are doing this. I know that Lenaro have done this once. Um, we've done this. I think Tizen have um, uh, open schematics for their SD MUX. Um, so an example of you know at least three different companies doing the same thing, um, and you know maybe with better collaboration there would be more awareness of that and, and maybe improved devices. Uh, Bay Libra, they have uh, probes for measuring power consumption. Um, so I think there's some activity in this space but quite often not everybody's aware of that. Um, and then the bit in the middle, the hardware abstraction, I, I think this is where the biggest gap is um, and this is where you bridge the hardware. Um, for example, if you've got a network um, power supply, someone still needs to write some code that knows where that is and what command to send to that to turn whatever port on and off. And that needs to be linked with the top layer, like Lava, where there's a hook that says, how do you turn a board on? And there's this bit in between that I think is missing. And I think this is the part where um, my suspicion is that everyone comes up with their own solution. I know that free electrons have something called Lava Bow, which seems to extend Lava to allow you to you know, uh, remotely uh, access boards for development. We have our own EB farm. Um, can you raise your hands if you've got your own? Sony has something called TTC. TTC, okay. Target, uh, tiny target control or control, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Okay, what talks that? Okay, thank you. So my vision is that if we come together, um, and I think there's you know, 50 or so people in this room that have some interest in working together, I think there's a lot more we can achieve together. Um, I think as a minimum, uh, an achievement that I'd really like to see is, is that we know who we all are so that we, we have some connections that we can you know, not reinvent the same wheel. Um, and I think that'll allow us to move out of the basics, simply turning boards on and off and doing some farm work to some more really interesting stuff like, I don't know, testing USB devices by removing them and reinserting them or similar. Tim? Wait, Sony has a debug board that does USB public lightning. Okay, and I think, I think Lenaro I've seen have some cube looking device that can stack to do similar things. Um, so I'd like to move on to um, the open discussion, um, I split this into two parts, but uh, I'd like to know who, who everyone is. Um, obviously, don't have time to do everybody, but um, what we're doing with farms, what problem we're trying to solve, um, what challenges you face, um, what solutions already exist. Um, we mentioned some other uh, TTC um, and different technologies. Simply knowing of their existence, I think, is really valuable. Um, and how can we calibrate? Um, Tim mentioned the, the lack of a mailing list. Maybe that would be helpful, or, or maybe a wiki. Um, I'd then like to talk about what it is we could do. Is it as simple as just having a place for information, or do we go beyond that and create this middle layer that can, can bridge a gap? Um, wouldn't it be nice if when you, you buy some hardware, like a USB relay, there's already a kind of driver or a config for this middle layer so that when you want to set up a farm, it's a kind of a case of app get install, and it already supports whatever hardware you've got. Um, so perhaps we could start off with uh, introducing ourselves. Is there anyone that has a farm that would like to uh, tell us a little about a little bit about themselves? I have a farm. 
Okay. <laughs> Can everyone hear Tim? Or do we need a microphone? Okay. Okay. So uh, I've been doing this a long time, actually. I started a test lab in uh, early 2000s, and that's why uh, we wrote TTC. But um, so I've been using TTC for board management. Um, doing Fuego is the test framework on top, and a variety of solutions that have evolved over the years for the stuff in between. Uh, and I just want to say, uh, so, uh, but I only have like two to three boards, right? Uh, I don't have uh, a lot of the kind of more complicated stuff, although I did just get myself a 28-port USB hub, so that gives me room to expand. Um, but what I want to say is if you don't introduce yourself here, uh, I really think we should get on a mailing list or get some, or a wiki at least with a page with all of our names and email addresses so we can communicate with each other and talk about some of these issues. Um, if we only got that out of the session, I think it would be a great start. But. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I've got a question. Oh, perhaps I'll come, I don't know if this works. I've come down. So my name's Kevin Hillman. I, since Kernel CI came up a few times, I'll introduce myself since I'm kind of one of the founding members of the Kernel CI project. And I have one of the largest labs contributing to Kernel CI. I have about 80 boards in my farm. And those labs, the pictures he showed there look super clean compared to my lab and my labs. Are <laughs> I was going to say, that's not messy. Yeah, those are, to me, that was like, man, I. Those, <laughs> I remember thinking, man, that is neat. Yeah, that, that is clean, yeah. In fact, when most people come to my lab, they usually ask me, why do I collect cables? Not why, not, <laughs> not why I collect boards. Um, so if you have questions about kernel CI and things like that, I, I'm happy to answer questions as well. And one thing else I was going to mention, uh, in the SD MUX category, there's these Wi-Fi SD cards now that actually basically make SD MUX, or SD MUXs, you don't need them anymore, or they're, they're a little more reliable. And I know some of the U-boot U-boot maintainers are using the Wi-Fi SD MUX cards or the Wi-Fi SD cards actually just to upgrade U-boot all the time over over Wi-Fi. So they seem to be just as I mean, they're not super they're not 100% reliable either, but the, they're more reliable than the SD MUXs that I've seen. So. See, I'm writing this down, but I wish it was going on Wiki, right? So yeah. The Wi-Fi wi SD cards. Yeah, they're they're SD. Regular, regular size SD cards that actually have Wi-Fi in them, so you can actually change the SD contents over Wi-Fi. Well, okay, which so is my yeah. came up when I said about Wiki. So why don't we just decide right now what Wiki we're going to use? Yeah, we didn't. Yeah, we'll we use, use something. Linux, like, right? So should we just start an Linux farming page? Yeah. Okay. Ship it. I'll just try to have one. <laughs> A, thing, a thought occurred to me while I was listening to this. Thanks, Andrew. Um, doesn't libvirt show us a way to solve this problem? I'm not saying libvirt the technology, but the guys behind libvirt came to the conclusion that they weren't going to create a single hypervisor API to control them all. But the idea to put a, a, a common wrapper library that allows people with bespoke backends to write a little shim that will drive their special exciting bit of hardware and people writing wrapper GUI, continuous integration, Jenkins plugins can target that bit of middleware. We were it, about that right before lunch, yeah, but they were kind I sat in that and they, the guys are doing great stuff, but they were writing, this is how we solved our problem. And so it was more a story of their project rather than any kind of idea to produce some sort of consistent model. Well, well so I'm really interested, what are the, what, I'm really interested, what are the verbs? What are the, what is the API between the upper layer and the middle layer? And, uh, you know, and libvirt has an API, and so maybe that's a starting point, but we need to, if we could define that, like you said, if we could define that, then you could, the board or the, what I'm now starting to call the DUT controller, the device under test controller, could come with a driver that just plugs into that and provides that API. Um, that'd be super nice. Um, anyway, I didn't want the mic. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I don't really want to hijack this discussion, but uh, basically these uh, ideas and requirements were what drove us to start this LabGrid stuff, to have something between the physical hardware and the automation layer, like Jenkins and PyTest and so on, to uh, yeah, abstract hardware control for testing and for other, other stuff. And 
yeah, the codes uh, on GitHub and LabGrid. So, and, and we use it in, in our lab, it has like 120 boards from our customers for CI and also for interactive control from yeah, our colleagues who sit at home and access those boards. Thanks, that sounds uh, really interesting. I'll have a look at that later. Um, Did you have a question? So I'm seeing a lot of um, like the consulting companies using this sort of technology and providing board farms. What can we do to get the original in equipment manufacturers and the SOC vendors to actually do this and contribute their results back as well? Any uh, responses on that? So Fuego, which is the test framework I'm working on, um, has a capability to send test results in to a common server. It's not as mature as the API that like kernel CI has. Um, but I don't, and we have some large companies that are using it. I, I, but nothing's gone public yet, so. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to So my name is Geert Uitroeven. I gave a presentation about the bo creating a board form last year. Uh, so my main motivation was to get the boards off my desk and into a form. So right now I have a board form of eight boards controlled by a BeagleBone Black. Uh, for power control, I use the Belivre Acme Cape for the BeagleBone Black. The BeagleBone Black also does uh, serial consoles. And for pressing buttons and resets, uh, resetting of the board, uh, I use a board with optocouplers. So last year I had just something on a proto board, but in the meantime I created a real PCB for it. Uh, I uploaded the KiCad files to GitHub. And you can actually order the board from uh, Eisler, which is some uh, maker's PCB support, uh, small company here in Europe. And that's it. If you have questions. Uh, I have one of the boards here, uh, if you want to take a look. Uh, it's my first PCB ever, so it's probably not that super <laughs> fancy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, is there any other experiences anyone wants to share with their board farms? Okay. Um, so we're making some good progress. We've got a uh, uh, e-wiki going. We've replaced SD Max with some Wi-Fi SD Max. We've got some uh, higher level software to look at. Um, can someone suggest any problems they currently have? Um, I've got some questions on uh, things that could be done. Um, it seems like there's some projects uh, ongoing that um, I wasn't familiar with. Um, anything from anyone? Sure. So you, you had mentioned like USB devices disappearing and, and so on. So one thing I've noticed with you, I've had with 80 plus boards, I've bought lots of USB serial adapters, like probably many of you have tinkered with. And uh, I've noticed that a lot of them just after, some of them just disappear after a day, some of them disappear after a couple months and you have to unplug them and replug them and they just show up again. And so I've just noticed that the, the cheaper of these cables, just they have more and more of these problems. You end up having USB devices disappearing all the time. And so I do not work for FTDI, so I don't want to, this is not an advertisement, this is experience. <laughs> but I've found that FTDI cables actually are just, they just work, they're just reliable. They're a lot more expensive than a lot of the cheaper ones, but they just work. And they also all have unique IDs on them, so writing UDEV rules and stuff for them to show up actually is, is quite reliable. So that's, that's one, little, one little tip if you're doing this. Just spend a little bit of extra money 
get your FTDI cables, and then you don't have to go out and unplug a cheap cable and plug it back in on a Sunday afternoon when your when your farm stops working. Yeah. Yes, so that's that, that's the caveat. There are a few boards out there that embed FTDI controllers on the board, and they do not put an EEPROM on with IDs on them, so they all show up as ID zero. So you still have they're still reliable, but you still have to write the FTD uh, UDEV rule for the USB port that they're plugged into, not that you, yeah. So there are there are caveats, but they still work way better. Uh, one thing which in our lab is causing uh, a lot of difficulty is that it seems it's not possible to buy USB hubs which are, have individual power port switching um, from a reliable manufacturer. So uh, yeah, we've been thinking a lot of, of building our own ones, but yeah, we are a software company, so. One thing I thought of on this that I've been thinking, I, I have I have these 28 port USB hubs and I have four of them and every port has a push button on the port. So I was actually thinking about just modifying one of those with an, yet another set of relays on top of this USB uh, plug that could push the buttons to, to do that. So that's, what, that's a relatively cheap solution, but again, one more pile of relays. But yeah, I, I have seen some USB hubs that have switchable ports, but they're only like four ports. Uh, and they're pretty expensive. Huh? I don't know, does anybody else have USB hubs with switchable power that work reliably? Yeah, uh, somebody from here. Yeah, um, I think that Tom Marini from Consulco mentioned one and in Portland it's uh, called Ips Ypsilon Kush. Yeah, so there's one that uh, you can control from software, just yeah, ports, just think, three, three ports, yeah. So it's not that much, but it's. Just, I think it's open hardware. So the the good thing is that you, you know, if you're an electronic engineer, you can scale that up because you, it's open software, and yeah, y yeah. I think also the driver is open source. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I think that kind of emphasizes the need for uh, a good wiki for information like this, just knowing where you can find this type of hardware. Okay. Pages this. okay. <laughs> Go to elinux slash board underscore farm, uh, both capitalized. And add your name to it in the people section. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, question? Yeah, you can add links. So, yeah, the other thing is please add your. Oh, sorry. Um, so if you go to the board farm page on the Linux, actually go to recent changes, it should be <laughs> at the top of the list. Uh, but um, if, you, if you don't mind us knowing your name and contact information, I tend to anonymize my email address by replacing the at sign with the word at. Hopefully that confuses the NSA. Um, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, uh, then, uh, if you don't mind adding your hardware that you're using, and and if you're using a particular set of software, that'd be good to know. So, like, if you've written your own, or like, I, I put down a couple like LabGrid, PDU client, uh, EB Farm, and TTC on a list there. Uh, and if you have links to any of the documentation on those, that'd be great. So, just start collecting information on on these things would be great. I think we're running out of time, but uh, I just wanted to mention two projects. Um, the Linaro people have been building this um, open the TAC test automation controller board. I don't know what the status of that is. It's basically a board for, for a, a PCB with connectors for four PCBs, which you can control a uh, network, USB, serial, and so on. And it is basically a BeagleBone shield just six, uh, 19 inches wide. And then there's from the um, Chromium OS uh, Google people, there's this servo board, which will basically have one board with a standardized connector where they can just connect a Chromium OS device and control everything. That's an, maybe an interesting idea to, to look for. Thank you. Uh, anyone got anything else to add before we close? No? Okay. Don't copy my markdown. I just realized I put the wrong region in the I just noted there's a there's overhead page for that port for the bit. Oh, is there? I don't know about that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, sure. So one one more one more plug for a talk later this week on tomorrow at ten ten fifty or whatever that ten fifty slot is. I'll be doing a talk on what we're calling lab in a box, which we've we've scaled down a lab, basically put a PC together with a bunch of small boards inside the PC, all powered off the PC power supply, switched by a Bay Libre Acme cape, with the idea being to kind of demonstrate how to easily put together a small lab with all the software pre-configured and stuff with Lava and the and, and working with kernel CI and all this stuff, call it all kind of in one PC. So it's not necessarily a model, but it, it shows how to put all the software and all the pieces together for a simple, you know, six or seven boards, in all packaged cleanly in one PC. So. Just quickly. Um, regarding mailing list and uh, before we start to exchange uh, pieces of paper with emails on it, so I will ask the LFIT guys to set up a mailing list, board farms, just watch lists.linuxfoundation.org. Okay? Thanks very much. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, hope it's been useful. Uh, thank you. Goodbye.